Good afternoon. My name is Jeff Grunfeld, and as chairman of the speakers program, I'd like to welcome you to our first of the fall quarter programs. Today we have with us a man of impressive credentials, an ex-Marine, service in the Defense Department, State Department, service in Vietnam and the RAND Corporation. And yet this man felt that ultimately his loyalties must lie with a higher cause, those of humanity. As Albert Speer wrote in his Inside the Third Reich, being in a position to know and nevertheless shunning knowledge creates direct responsibility for the consequences. This responsibility led Daniel Ellsberg to make public the Pentagon Papers, a document that exposes our intervention in an unjust and inhumane war. By the way, a copy of his book, Papers on the War, is available at the student store in paperback and it's a must reading for everyone. A hero of modern times, would you give a warm welcome to Daniel Ellsberg. Thank you. Yesterday was a, an anniversary for my friend Tony Russo and me. It was three years ago yesterday, three million tons of bombs ago, that we started Xeroxing the Pentagon Papers in Hollywood. It was two million tons ago, or two years ago, that I last spoke here. I gave two lectures. How many people were here for those? Anybody? Just a few, the way things turn over. That was right after Cambodia. I just left the Rand Corporation. I was free to speak to the public at last. So I was doing it really for the first times in my life. Looking back at that period, that may have been the last chance to end the Indochina War. As I try to understand what's happened in this country and between this country and Indochina in the last quarter of a century, and to understand the mechanisms that have kept us in and that I think can keep us in for a very much longer time than this. Cambodia stands out as one time when conditions were just right for an escape. It was a kind of a hatch out for the war, for Indochinese and for this country. There was still enough Americans there being killed. There was an American ground operation that the president had described in such rhetorical terms as to suggest the likelihood of future escalations. So one could see the casualty rate going back up and perhaps even the draft going back up at that moment. There was rage even in Congress, even among Republicans in Congress for having been bypassed at that moment and lied to. Rage in the country as a whole and there were the circumstances of the Kent State killing, the Jackson State killing, which seemed to symbolize the colonial war coming home, as colonial wars always do, and as this one will do much more in the future. At that moment, a quarter of a million people piled into Washington. I happened to be in Washington at that time, getting ready for hearings before the Fulbright Committee. They failed to shut down Washington. They didn't try, although a lot of people there wanted to. They failed to say, in other words, as clearly as they might have, this town stops. There is a crisis at home so long as we create crises in Indochina. Instead, the various leaders, the mor uh, moratorium, the new mob, and the other people at that time decided so to show discipline, to show that a very peaceful rally could be carried out. Congress in turn settled for the very minimal uh, move of the Church Cooper bill, which drained away all the uh, rather flaccid uh, energy that surged up very uh, momentarily in Congress. By the time that I spoke here, a month or so later, a few weeks later after Cambodia, it was already getting to be too late. There was energy on this campus then to go out door to door talking to people about the coming elections in September 70, in uh, the fall of 70. But you'll remember, perhaps, that the war was not even an issue in the fall of 70, finally. So that chance was pretty well missed. It also meant for me the last time that I would try to uh, get the news to the public about the Pentagon Papers through the Congress. It looked as though there were going to be hearings right after Cambodia. 
I'd given the Pentagon Papers to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in the fall of 1969, uh, almost a year earlier, about nine months earlier, and nothing had happened. But now they were really going to have hearings, except when the mood faded away after the Church Cooper bill. Uh, they weren't held either, and the public didn't get the Pentagon Papers at that time. It was another invasion later, and another million tons of bombs later, which brings us to a year ago, that the public finally did get the Pentagon Papers. There was a time in my involvement in Vietnam when I thought as Sergeant Lonnie Franks in Thailand thought, when he saw people, 200 officers and men actually, spending their time falsifying the record that was going upwards about the bombing that General Lavelle was conducting in Vietnam. He thought, as I thought, the president is not getting the word. If the Tsar only knew, he wouldn't be letting this happen entirely. So he finally uh, gave the word to his congressman, Harold Hughes. And in this case, the word did get out right away. Maybe uh, that's the major impact in some ways of the Pentagon Papers having gotten out finally of that Xeroxing that Tony and I did three years ago. The 200 officers and men would spend their nights falsifying the documents. Since before that, they wouldn't have bothered. They weren't worried that the documents would get out. Presidents could lie in safety without a fear of being contradicted by their own memos and records. And so now, progress. Bomb during the day, change the records at night. And uh, maybe a couple years from now, there will really be less chance than there was for Tony and me to uh, reproduce records despite the age of Xerox will be in 1984 where the records get changed fast enough so that no trace really remains of what's really happening. In any case, they did come out, as I say, a year ago after I decided not only that the president was part of the problem some three years ago, but that Congress too was part of the problem after the performance out in Cambodia, after the inability to get the Pentagon Papers out to the public. I thought it's the public that doesn't know. The public that has been lied to. They have to get the information so they can act as citizens in a democracy. And I hope, I can only hope, when they know what we have done and why we have done it and what we are probably going to keep doing, uh, they, you, your neighbors, your fathers, mothers, bosses and whatnot, teachers, you will act to end the war. Can you hear me, by the way, back there? How's the sound? Okay, if you can't hear, let me know. Well, they've been out for a year. The result would seem kind of disappointing. People like to torture me on interviews by asking me what I think the Pentagon Papers have accomplished. And it's possible, in the end, it's not very much. Certainly the rate of bombing has not changed. A million tons a year still, more than a million then, since the Pentagon Papers got out. This week is one more anniversary, Tony Lewis pointed out in the New York Times. It marks the third year, eighth month, and one week that Richard Nixon has been pursuing the war in Vietnam or winding it down, which happens to be the identical period of time between Pearl Harbor and the Japanese surrender in World War II. So as of this week, then Richard Nixon's war alone, which is a continuation, of course, of 20 years of Democrat and Republican war before that had become longer than World War II. And by November, our president will have dropped twice as many bombs on Indochina as we dropped in all of World War II. Four million tons compared to two million tons in all of World War II, plus one million in Korea. Adding to a total then of tonnage on Indochina, that you may or may not have heard. Everybody thinks he's heard this, but I find that they're, uh, they can be surprised when they hear it. It's a total tonnage equivalent to Korean War plus three times World War II that we have dropped on Indochina alone in the last seven years. During that time, in the last year, 
I was doing really what I'd been doing for several years before that, like a lot of other people, though not as many, I would say, as we will need in the end, working more or less full time to try to bring this war to an end, try to bring our involvement to an end. So I was doing what I'd been doing for several years, asking myself what to do next, what mattered, what, what my opportunities were myself and how I could use them. I had a lot of access to media during that period, thanks to the Justice Department's uh, unprecedented action of prosecuting a leak, prosecuting a newspaper source for the first time in our history, following up the unprecedented injunction against the New York Times. But when the question came, well, what do the Pentagon Papers really say, I used to say to, uh, I've said really rather steadily during that year, don't ask me. Yes, I was an expert for the government. That's why I had access to the Pentagon Papers. The time has passed for you to learn about this war from experts. It's experts who have lied to you, experts who have perhaps told the truth to their bosses but kept their mouths shut to the public and wired us in, nailed us into this war for 25 years. You don't owe much to experts. And besides, the issues of this war aren't issues that require experts to understand. They're matters of war and peace, of life and death for this country and for the people we're killing. You don't really have to be an expert to understand when you're being lied to if you have the documents. The facts are there. There's an, it's an old saying, you don't have to be an ichthyologist to know when a fish stinks. And to read the Pentagon Papers, I think, is to learn all you need to know about why we need to get, why we must get out of this war immediately. That's my opinion, but don't take my opinion. You read them. See if you come to a different conclusion. How many people here have held in their hands one or more of the four volumes of the Gravel edition, the Beacon Press edition of the Pentagon Papers? Not, not bad, more than, uh, more than some groups. How many have read a considerable part of the Bantam book, the New York Times version? Well, more. Even so, uh, just in the last week or so, now that I'm speaking again, in particular during this recess in my trial and before the election, I really had to face the fact that uh, I was kidding myself on how many people would actually read them, whether it would get read. I have to admit the Bantam book is a very dull book, and the Pentagon Papers are uh, not all fascinating uh, any way you look at them. Hard to get people to read them. I should have known that. I'm going to talk a little bit about what is in the Pentagon Papers, something that I really haven't done over the last year, because I think the story is in there, what we need to know, and I think we do need to know it. It's not inevitable that Richard Nixon will be elected. It's uh, desperately urgent, I think, that he not be. It will take a miracle. It's a necessary miracle, in my opinion. But let's talk now on the assumption that what everyone is predicting comes about. Let's just take that for our reality, that Richard Nixon will be in office for four more years at, at least. Tony told me the other day he'd read that Martha Mitchell has predicted an, uh, a 99.9% .9 victory for Nixon this time. And I told him, if he, I think that's wrong by four years. I think his 99% victory is for his third term. But uh, at, at any rate, I think the Constitution will not be the constraint even uh, for him then, even that it is now, which is not as much as it's been for other people. But taking that reality, to me, that's a reality of four more years of bombing, four million tons more, at least, of bombing, and quite possibly much beyond that. Because I think that right now we're facing one more escape hatch from the war. We've got another five or six weeks left. And when that passes, there won't be another one for a very long time, possibly much longer than four years. The casualties will be down, American casualties, perhaps indefinitely. The bombing will stay the same, but we're not even hearing about the bombing on the evening news. The war already, to a considerable extent, has gotten invisible. And if Nixon and Mitchell comes back, if his Justice Department has their way in, de in uh, deterring the media, 
from covering the war adequately, as they've already done to a considerable extent, the war will get even less visible, really truly invisible. The way, let's say, the, the killing in Burundi is today, as far as we're concerned. So that uh, it's, it's hard for me to imagine that there will be uh, as much pressure on him in the future to end this war or his successor to accept a defeat in Vietnam than there is today. And there isn't apparently enough today to diselect Richard Nixon. And it's going to get less. So we're talking then about a war that's not only gone on 25 years but can go on 10, 12, 20 years more since I don't think the other side will give up. I don't think we will ever get out of this war unless we do it in the next month or two. We will never get out of it, it turns out, without coming to understand it. A few years ago, maybe in 68, with the uh, debacle of the Tet Offensive, maybe in 70 after Cambodia, maybe even in 71 after the debacle of Laos and the Pentagon Papers, but before the China trip, maybe there was a chance to get out without understanding the war, just because it cost too much, just because it was a mess, because people were tired of it, and nothing too much would have to change in their perception of America, of themselves, or of our system. We wouldn't have to change the system too much. In the end, if we get out of it now, it will be because we have learned reasons for ending even a rather cheap endless colonial war that doesn't take much of our attention, doesn't call for a draft, doesn't involve many U.S. casualties. We'll have learned why we shouldn't be trying to dictate the governor of Saigon or hiring the police force in Saigon or torturing people in the prisons of Saigon. And that'll mean just learning a lot. Why haven't we learned it so far? Because it's learning about ourselves in very painful ways, on the one hand. That's painful for every American. It involves, if we're going to change the way we behave, changing our lives for a lot of us. And it involves changing the distribution of power. It, it involves understanding our society in a way that will probably lead to change in that society. And that's one major reason why it's resisted, why that kind of understanding is resisted, why the lies go on. Let me quote just a couple things that um, are things that entered my head, that changed my head. I won't try to give you any kind of comprehensive 10-minute history of the war that might be worth doing, but I'm not going to try today. The Pentagon Papers are there. Uh, I urge you very much to get hold of the four-volume edition. It's $20, which is very much cheaper than Xeroxing. And the... Um, and in fact, there's a fifth volume now edited by Chomsky and Zinn, put out by Beacon Press, of analytical papers on the Pentagon Papers that are extremely good. The American Friends Service Committee has a little booklet coming out, about 130 pages, called Credibility Gap, mainly quotes from the Pentagon Papers. That'll be out this month. And I, I think that's very much worth getting, giving to your uh, parents, friends, neighbors, and whatnot, teachers. Also, we have here an even shorter version, the uh, Pentagon Papers Digest, put out by the Indochina Information Project. There's a box of them here, which won't go very far, but I understand they'll be available when? On a table at Brune Walk. On a table at Brune Walk, eventually. And that project needs help, by the way, but again, this is an even shorter version that it's worth looking at. The point was that when I got back from Vietnam, I'd been there two years for the State Department. I'd... Um, worked in RAND uh, for years before that, but not on Vietnam. I'd worked on, the, uh, on Vietnam in the Defense Department for a year before that. So I came back after three years of work on Vietnam. And it was another, really, before I got heavily into the Pentagon Papers project. And I find, in retrospect, I didn't know very much about that country. I knew quite a bit about our decision-making for the years I'd participated. I didn't know much about Vietnam or our opponents, the NLF or the DRV, Hanoi government. You don't learn much about that in the government or Vietnam, and in fact, you don't learn much that's correct from the Pentagon Papers, because the Pentagon Papers are the war as seen through Washington eyes. They didn't know much about our opponent or about Vietnam, and they still don't. They still haven't even read the Pentagon Papers, in fact. 
But there is a lot to learn about how we've been governed and what we have seen ourselves as, as up to in that 25 years. I want to mention a couple things that, as I say, I didn't know while I was over there, and it took me these documents to, uh, to learn. <clears throat> Very briefly, we've just passed another anniversary, really, in August, the August of 1945, actually, was the time when Ho Chi Minh entered Saigon and when Emperor Bao Dai formally abdicated as Emperor of Indochina to President Ho Chi Minh, accepting the role of Supreme Counselor. At which point, there began a period of 20 days in which Ho Chi Minh as President ruled all of Indochina. Then when the French were rearmed by the British, General Gracie, they took over in the southern part of Indochina. But for a year and a half, Ho Chi Minh then ruled Indochina as head of state, recognized as such and given honors as such in France while he negotiated for the final outcome in southern Indochina, Cochin China as it was then called. In March of 46, Santini for France and Ho Chi Minh signed an agreement that the status of all of Vietnam, that is including Cochin China, would be settled by a referendum. This was never held, but Ho was in France then in 46 in order to negotiate on that point. Perhaps this is all familiar to you. I must say that I went through several years of working for the government with something of the image of an insurgency uh, with the model in my mind, I suppose, of Castro landing with 12 men going into the Sayer Maestra and fighting his way against the dictator. We're talking, I discovered a few years ago then, about a regime, good or bad, a regime that had ruled with the consent of the Vietnamese people as the regime, a bunch of officials who had run the post office, the police force, the bureaucracy, the army as it was, the Viet Minh, everything, had occupied the government buildings. It was the government of Vietnam. And what began in mid-46 and late-46 was what we ourselves saw as a French attempt at military reconquest of this former colony. There was really only one other such attempt in after World War II, the Dutch attempt to fight their way back in Indonesia. That was aborted very largely because of our own efforts, our own diplomatic pressure on the Dutch to stop that, reflecting our supposed mm, actual anti-colonial tradition. But in France, we needed France at that point, partnership in Europe, we wanted a victory of essentially conservative forces in France. It was a time when the Communist Party was in the government. It was the largest single party then, as now, I guess. And uh, so we went along with the French desires to go back. We recognized French sovereignty. In the fall of that year, as Ho was about to come back to um, Indochina, he told Santini, don't send me back empty-handed. Give me something to go back with. You will not regret it. If we must fight, we will fight. You will kill ten of ours, and we will kill one of yours. But in the end, it is you that will tire. A month later, the French provoked incidents outside Haiphong, as it happened, which led them to shell and bomb Haiphong and cause 6,000 civilian deaths. A month later, fighting broke out in the outskirts of Hanoi, and the Viet Minh began a fighting withdrawal from their government offices, taking the civil service with them. When Bao Dai, incidentally, ab uh, moved off again, went back to Hong Kong, his position as Supreme Counselor was taken by the Catholic Archbishop of Hanoi as Supreme Counselor, and who stayed in that position for another three years. All this is background to the first assessment by a U.S. government official for his bosses, for the president, of the war which was then breaking out. The fighting started on December 19th, 1946. On December 23rd, 1946, John Carter Vincent, director of the Far East, uh, Bureau of Far Eastern Affairs, a man who was hounded out of his office for his foresight, basically, by McCarthyite forces a few years later, sent a memo to Under Secretary of State Dean Acheson four days now after the fightings broke, which said this, 
Although the French in Indochina have made far-reaching paper concessions to the Vietnamese desire for autonomy, French actions on the scene have been directed toward whittling down the powers and territorial extent of the Vietnam Free State. This process the Vietnamese have continued to resist. At the same time, the French themselves admit they lack the military strength to reconquer the country, as they did. Parenthetically here, only the aid which we were then giving them through France, which they channeled to Indochina, made it possible for them to fight even at that low scale. Four years later, in 1950, or actually three years later, they were at the end of their rope unless we came in directly with aid to the French and uh, their puppet Indochinese forces fighting, which we did. From that moment on, and really, as I say, from 46 on, there has never been a year, I believe, from reading this record, that there would have been political conflict in Vietnam that approached the scale of a war had not the U.S. provided the money, the equipment, eventually the combat support for that fighting. Which is to say that we bear responsibility not just for the last 7 million tons of bombs and not just for the 12 million people who have been killed, wounded, or made refugees, 11.5 million people since 1965, 6 million of them under Richard Nixon. But our responsibility goes back much further than that right to the beginnings of the conflict. To continue, though, with, with Vincent's, to end his uh, message to Atchison. In brief, with inadequate forces, with public opinion sharply at odds, with a government rendered largely ineffective through internal division, the French have tried to accomplish in Indochina what a strong and united Britain has found it unwise to attempt in Burma. Given the present elements in the situation, guerrilla warfare may continue indefinitely. I happened to see John Carter Vincent where he's retired in Cambridge a few months ago. I found that he was living in town there and I wanted to drop in and pay my respects for that memo, among other things. I asked him if he remembered it and he said yes, he did very well. And he said, what was it that I said then? Ten years? Fifteen years? And I said, you said indefinitely. That was just about the 25th anniversary of that memo that I was speaking to him as I say, and it hasn't changed. Two years later, incidentally, just before we got in completely, the Department of State was making an official policy assessment for Harry Truman with this statement, we have not urged the French to negotiate with Ho Chi Minh even though he probably is now supported by a considerable majority of the Vietnamese people because of his record as a communist and the communist background of many of the influential figures in and about his government. Our greatest difficulty in talking with the French and in stressing what should and should not be done, very difficult then as now, has been our inability to suggest any practicable solution to the Indochina problem. As we are all too well aware that of the unpleasant fact that communist Ho Chi Minh is the strongest and perhaps the ablest figure in Indochina, and any suggested, and as had been said a paragraph earlier, had the support of a considerable majority of the Vietnamese people, and any suggested solution which excludes him is an expedient of uncertain outcome. We are naturally hesitant to press the French too strongly or to become deeply involved so long as we are not in a position to suggest a solution or until we are prepared to accept the onus of intervention. Well, it wasn't two years, it was for two years uh, later that that onus of intervention stared us as the only alternative to a solution which we were not prepared to consider among the alternatives in those days, the solution of letting the majority of the Vietnamese people choose their own government. That solution was then as now not practicable for the President of the United States. That happened to be a Democrat, and 1948, an election year, was not a good year for him to lose Indochina to communism, especially then in 1949 when Richard Nixon and others told him that he had lost China to communism, 1950 became a very bad year to add Indochina to that loss. 51 was not a good year either. That was before a presidential election. 52 was a presidential election. 53, a new administration came into office 
that had come in in part by accusing Harry Truman of losing China. So they weren't about to lose Indochina that fast. It's been like that for 20 more years. 1972 is not a good year, it turns out, in the eyes of Richard Nixon for him to lose Indochina to communism. His terms, he thinks, have come down very far from earlier days, but they still don't include as a practicable solution letting Vietnamese hire their own police and army and choose their own political way of living. That's not practical for the President of the United States, and it may not be next year or the year after or for a long time, unless we in this country really change our attitudes as to what our business is in the world and at home. Because of the scheduling here, I, I wish we had a little more time to go on to some of the other administrations. I would want to quote, I think, if I were to choose from these papers, a crucial lie from each administration. It's uh, a little hard to, to pick among them all. Uh, the uh, 61 era of Kennedy saying that he had been advised to put in only advisors, that that would be adequate, whereas Maxwell Taylor had told him at that time that only combat troops at that time could save the situation for our policy, taking for granted that our policy was a legitimate one. But Kennedy chose at that time deliberately to lie to the public about what had been recommended, what had been proposed, thus giving them an entirely different notion of what we thought we were getting into and what, why we were doing it. 1963, the Ziem coup lied about not only at the time but by all the subsequent Kennedy historians as to our involvement. I remember trying to convince a CBS executive one very hot night in Cambridge while my wife and I were still out of sight that there was a very good story in the Ziem coup. I couldn't convince him at first just by describing it. That he, I said, the Times is putting this stuff out. The Washington Post was already under injunction. The Ziem coup was a very dramatic and visual story, un unlike a lot. I could suggest lots of film clips that would go with it. And uh, he said, no, that's just history. Don't you have, any, have, any, have anything, something uh, really recent? We've got to have something timely. I said, this is relevant. You ought to read it. Finally, I pressed one of the cables into his hands, a cable that you can find, I think, in the Bantam book, in which now, in which uh, McGeorge Bundy is describing in great detail the considerations that Henry Cabot Lodge should follow on the eve of the coup. The possibility for evacuating Americans, for intervening if necessary. It ends, best of my memory, in any case, once a coup has begun, it is the in the interests of the United States that it not fail. And I remember his reading that at about 11 o'clock in a very hot night in Cambridge, half naked. And he looked up and he said, that's murder. And I said, yeah, that's murder. It took CBS, actually they almost did it. It took them a full day to decide that things were too hot for them with the Staggers hearings coming up to uh, have a program then on the Pentagon Papers. And actually they've never had one since, I have to say. Anyway, we go on to my period, the Johnson period, the descriptions by Rusk of the fact that we knew very little about Vietnamese operations before the Tonkin Gulf incidents, South Vietnamese operations against the coast of North Vietnam. Operations which I knew were American operations, hired, run, totally controlled by CIA and by MACV in Saigon, that uh, we knew them in the utmost detail. We knew the placing of 81 millimeter mortar rounds. When I say we, I mean people like Rusk and McGeorge Bundy. New operations of how many 81 millimeter mortar rounds we were going to land on the Cape Mui Ron radar site in North Vietnam, or how many junk fishermen we were going to uh, kidnap for interrogation before the supposedly unprovoked attack on our destroyers in the Tonkin Gulf kind of petty stuff for a Secretary of State to be spending his time on, but that was the only war we had then. It wasn't for a few months later that they could get down to the, the more uh, respectable, uh, challenging jobs of picking bombing targets at the Tuesday luncheons in the White House. 
One question that can be asked about all this history is why it was, until a year ago, all still classified top secret. And I think these examples, which are not exactly random, but they're, uh, they're typical examples, answer that question. Why is John Carter Vincent's memo, policy memo of 25 years ago, still top secret? That is, was until June last year? Well, obviously, that the president had been told that we were fighting people who had the majority of the support of the Vietnamese people. You can see why that would have to be top secret. How about the fact that we planned, I didn't mention this, but that we planned from the immediate aftermath of the Geneva Accords to subvert those accords by force, by buying an army and a police force that would suppress by force every element in South Vietnam dedicated to obeying the accords, to holding the election they called for. Again, you can see why that's top secret. Incidentally, the, I think the first thing deleted from the expurgated government version of the Pentagon Papers, the first white space to be found chronologically is in Book 8, which they, they books don't go in chronological order and has to do with that shelling of Haiphong by the French in 1946. And again, you can see why the American people is just as well. It's a little too early for them to know that, what it was that started this conflict that we then proceeded to back. The Ziem coup, the lying about the troops we were going to send, the lying about the Tonkin Gulf. That's why things are top secret. If you have that capability to keep secrets from the American public, you can carry out policies like these for 25 years. You can carry out covert wars and then invisible wars, ultimately. And really, I hope it's true that you can't do it without that. The lying to us is, in a way, a kind of compliment. It's an assumption that you really can't carry out an endless colonial war with the support of the American people if they know quite clearly what you're doing. I hope that's true. I hoped it three years ago. That's why I put out the Pentagon Papers. But a test is coming. It may not be true. If Nixon wins with the kind of landslide that is foretold now, it'll be hard to answer the question is this being done with the consent of the American people? You could say that Congress was lied into the Tonkin Gulf Resolution. You could say that less easily, that their complicity was bought by lies a couple years later. You could say the American people had been lied to really up until about last year. But the word is out now. And yet, we see these polls that uh, suggest enormous support for Richard Nixon. Uh, perhaps there is a great deal of support right here. I don't know if... L let me ask, just to see who I'm talking to. How many people here would expect to vote for Nixon in this election? Well, maybe there's a few more than that. Who knows? And, and maybe we should feel glad. I don't know. They don't raise their hands about it. But uh, uh, the question really is, I think they have to ask themselves, and really everybody here has to ask themselves, how much do they really expect the bombing to stop? Do they really expect the war to end? And if not, how many more bombs do you expect? How many more victims, refugees, killed, wounded, do you expect? And how do you justify that to yourself? But let me not speak at this moment only to the Nixon supporters here. I've been going around the country lately and I find a very baffling and, and ominous or disheartening mood in the country. It is baffling to me, so I don't uh, take despair from it entirely. I'd like to understand it better. Maybe in the few minutes we have for questions here, there could be some comments on it. I have more time, incidentally, but I understand there's regulations here that may, may make us break this off. The question as to uh, what the American people think they're doing when they support Nixon, is this entirely with their consent that he's carrying on this war? Do they believe, for example, the war is about to end? Is it true that they really don't care, as many people tell me? They just don't care about Asian casualties or about what we do. If that is true, then the task of changing that 
is going to be a very, very long struggle. It'll have to be done by us. And it, it does have to be done in any case, well, even if McGovern wins, obviously, for a long time. But it'll have to be done even before ending the war, and that's very bad news for Indochina. I think really that in the next month or two, before this election, the next six weeks, anyone who does less than he might to register, to whip up funds, to get McGovern elected, or to diselect Nixon uh, is the issue in this case, uh, will bear to that degree responsibility for the next four million tons of bombs. And uh, I wouldn't want to have that on laying on me, and I would hope uh, not many people here do. The issue is, I think, I, I think, hope you'll recognize, I've, I've tried to use this time to talk a little about what I came to understand about where we'd gotten to, not just to make a campaign speech, but it would certainly be wasting this opportunity wrongly to fail to say that the issue I think in November is the issue between war and peace, simply, as far as these two candidates are concerned. And if, as the polls are right, that opportunity passes, then now and then the issue to face is not do the American people care, but how much do each of you care, and what are you going to do about it in your lives? Thank you. There's a microphone right here in the center for those who want to address questions to Daniel Ellsberg. Also, Also, the week of the 16th, October 16th through 20th, there's UCLA's Into China Peace Week, starting off with Ramsey Clark under the ASSP, who will be here Monday at 12 noon, also at Jan Steps. And if you want further information, Tuesday, tomorrow evening, there'll be a meeting at Royce Hall, 160, 8 p.m. Mr. Ellsberg. Okay. Hi. Hi. Uh, when I discuss this subject with my father, two points he frequently brings up that I can't counter are that uh, whenever the North Vietnamese take over a city, they come in and massacre uh, <coughs> hundreds of people, especially the heads of state or whatever. And the second one is that... Uh, if there's not much support for uh, the South Vietnamese government, how do they get so many South Vietnamese soldiers to fight? Do you know anything about that? Yeah. Let me... Uh, le incidentally, uh, that's an, an interesting way to frame uh, the question, I think, worthwhile in terms of how one discusses with other people. Has your father read, would you say, any of these things? Like, maybe this would be a good thing to start him on. Uh, has he looked at the Bantam book or the Gravel edition at all? I don't know. I doubt it. It's uh, Or, for that matter, uh, one of the essays in this book, my book, has the advantage of summarizing a certain amount of the Pentagon Papers, may answer some of this. On the last question, how do they get people to fight for them, I think that the it comes down to this. It has been an aspect of American policy that communist-led movement, social movement, shall not win shall not take over in southern Vietnam, and that's been true for 25 years now. This is taken so much as a fact of life by Vietnamese, and they understand so well that the Vietnamese, a minority in South Vietnam, I would say, who are living in tunnels, fighting for revolution and for independence and for unification, that they are not going to quit. That means that Vietnamese know, if they're young, from the first day of their lives that they're living with what may be an endless war. And the choice that faces them is whether to join, is whether to fight on the side that bombs or the side that gets bombed. Whether to fight, if they're male, young males, uh, for miserable pay, living in hovels with their families, or to fight with no pay, living in tunnels under the bombs without their families. It's not really surprising, I think, that in a very poor country, people facing that choice, you, you buy 
quite a bit of mercenary support. And I don't use those terms. I think I've described that in terms that are not very pejorative as far as those people are concerned. They are our victims, the ones who live, the ones who die, as much as the Viet Cong or anybody else that we kill. What is amazing, you might say, is that, as there was in this country 200 years ago, uh, you'll find people who live in the tunnels and the brush and the forest to fight the greatest power on earth. Fight en enough of them to do that, to keep it going. Yeah. Uh, maybe I've also answered the first part. This is a war going on. Thanks to us, it is a war. I think that the casualties now, the political victims that are caused in these cities, as in Wei, perhaps in Bin Din, uh, are, the best answer I can give, are to be judged uh, in terms of the wartime situation. It's hard to, it would be wrong to judge them in abstraction from that. That isn't to say that there will be no victims, no more Vietnamese victims. No one will die violently for political reasons if we leave. I did say there will be nothing like a war and that the war that's going on now is causing victims, all of whom basically are our victims, victims of our policy. And I wonder if your father has faced the bloodbath that whoever he voted for, he's paying for as a taxpayer. He's paying for the napalm and the bombs. Ask him, if I say this rhetorically, but I put it to all of you, ask him if he knows how many victims there have been in this process of winding down the war. The answer is six million, four million refugees, two million killed and wounded in Indochina. To talk about bloodbaths that will follow the departure of the B-52s and the napalm is a, is a kind of pitiful distraction. I'd, and that's not a judgment of your father. Uh, it's not even a judgment of his generation. The distraction that people are allowing themselves, almost anything other than working on this election, and I don't say that as a wild party horse, is a distraction this month from the business of this country of ending, of ending the war. Well, Thanks. thank you. Yeah, in a January 1969 issue of Foreign Affairs, Henry Kissinger wrote an article. I can't hear that myself. I in, don't a, <laughs> in a January 1969 issue of Foreign Affairs, Henry Kissinger outlined his peace plan. This year? Uh, you mean an earlier one? 1969. Oh, right, yeah. And uh, he basically said that he, he thought that the, the war wasn't what the American propaganda machine had made it out to be. And he based his argument for continuing a war, if it had to be continued, on the fact that if we stop the war, then the American commitment all around the world to keep peace in Western Europe and in Asia would be uh, mitigated by our defeat in Vietnam, and that uh, that would truly endanger world peace. And I was wondering if you could address yourself to, to that. And don't okay. you think it would be better if people addressed themselves to, to the um, question of, what's really behind why the Nixon administration is in Vietnam. I mean, he realizes that um, that two doesn't have the support of the people, but he's there because he feels that uh, America can't stand the defeat. Why not argue that? If America can't stand defeat, uh, it's interesting that Richard Nixon saw fit to promise an end to the war uh, in 1968. Uh, he's changing his tune as to what it was he promised then. Uh, in fact, let me, uh, let me give you, take one minute here. The point being, I think, by the way, that the answer to your question is, I think the American people, the mood is different from what it is was several years ago, and it reflects in large part three and a half years of the President of the United States using the pulpit as Theodore Roosevelt called it, of his position, the highest pulpit in the land, to educate the people of this country, to focus their attention almost hypnotically, to distract it like a magician, to use another metaphor, onto things like blood baths, potentially, hypothetically, some years after we leave. And uh, words like humiliation, defeat, commitment, you know, peacekeeping elsewhere, to really distract people by words like that away from the reality of what it is we are doing and have done last month and will do next month. And then he really has succeeded considerably in this. He has sold an endless war. I, I think that, the, in other words, the mood is different now from what it was even four years ago, and there is more attention on that.
I think that quite apart from everything else he's done, that was an evil thing for a man to do in that position. To use the power of his position, his credibility, the trust in the president, and the access to information of the president to teach a nation that they should continue doing what they're doing. By the way, if you add up all those motives that you've described and confront them with the simple question, do they give us a right to kill a single Vietnamese? I think that those questions can't, can't survive as major uh, policy, especially... Maybe, maybe you didn't understand the question. Yeah. The question was, if world peace is at stake, I'm not saying it is, but the Nixon argument is, is yeah. that if we lose in Vietnam, there could yeah. be a nuclear war, there could be a confrontation between... What I'm Russia saying is that that, by the way, that wasn't said just by Nixon. It's been, I don't want to hang that in that. That's Kissinger's argument. Or Kissinger. That was basically just a repetition of Dean Acheson. It didn't even start with John Foster Dulles. Dean Acheson, Foster Dulles, into the Kennedy administration, into the Johnson administration. I served administrations that made those arguments. I found them plausible and persuasive even in 64 and 65 to a degree. As late, I would say, as 1969, I thought there was as much to them uh, enough to them to make it worth considering what Henry Kissinger called, you know, a decent interval, a graceful way out, depending on what the price was. That was as I saw it then. That was before I'd finished reading the Pentagon Papers, I might say. And uh, that's why I worked for Nixon. That's why I worked for Kissinger in the first months of 69. I thought he would get out fairly quickly and that these kinds of things were enough to make it worthwhile an extra month maybe of the war. Right? The trouble was, as I say, how many people are focusing on the fact that the price tag for those benefits has been six million casualties and refugees? Would they really have accepted that? If they would, the country's worse off than I think. I think what's really happening is that rather than focus on that real price, moral price, and price in lives that we're paying, they're rather uh, talking still about things like the humiliation and the world peace. And that's a kind of madness. The argument that world peace is being preserved by this, does the president, does an, any American president get the benefit of the doubt when he comes up with, her, with a reason like that for what we're doing? It's nonsense. But it's such obvious nonsense, I don't think it's really excusable in some ways to believe that. At least I can excuse myself, if I may, a little more in 64 for giving him the benefit of the doubt or taking that seriously than I can in 71 or 72. It's a kind of madness for the country to be focusing on things other than the war issue and in, in arguments like that, and that, that madness is going on. I meant to, um, to cite one thing here. When I was in Miami recently uh, for the Republican convention, I heard Nixon say, as many of you did probably in his acceptance speech on television, It is. His uh, standing in this convention hall four years ago, I pledged to seek an honorable end to the war in Vietnam. We have made great progress toward that end. We brought over half a million men home, etc. A week later, he was asked in Washington at a press conference, Mr. President, how do you reconcile your 1968 campaign promise to end the war with the massive bombing of North Vietnam that is now going on? Answer. Well, in terms of what I said in 1968, all of you who are following me will remember that I said we would seek an honorable end to the war. We have come a long way in reaching that, and again, the casualties are down, the troops are down. He says nothing about the bombing or the cost, to be sure, but uh, that's what he does say. Just before I set out on a trip going around, having asked a lot of newspaper men if they could get out for the files for me what Nixon had in fact said in 68, because I really didn't give the benefit of the doubt to presidents on that anymore, not just to Republican mm -hmm. ones. Uh, the day I left, my wife came and said, I have a present for you. She'd gone to the New York Times and gotten out of the file, Xeroxed, paid for the Xerox copy. They never having uh, reimbursed me for anything. Um, this statement from 1968, same place in Miami. I pledge to you tonight that the first priority foreign policy objective of our next administration will be to bring an honorable end to the war in Vietnam. We shall not stop there, 
We need a policy to prevent more Vietnams. So it's bring, not seek. Find, not seek. There's a, a number of uh, questions I think this raises. Uh, one is, how is it that he felt he had to promise to bring an end in 68 and it's okay to promise to seek it now? Well, obviously the costs are lower. But uh, I'm afraid it's because he has successfully sold a war that uh, he wasn't about to try to sell in 1968. That is his responsibility, but it's also uh, the buyer who should have should have been more bewaring by the buyer. But also, we have to ask ourselves, how come nobody picked him up on that? I've seen not one column. How many of you here have read 1984? Well, I just reread it recently. I mean, I read it 20 years ago, probably. It explains, I think, a great deal of what's going on. If you read Goldstein's description of 1984, Tony pointed out to me the other day when I mentioned this to him, you know, one of the things in 1984 was they weren't quite sure what year it was. I don't know if it could be this much earlier. But anyway, uh, in those days, you remember, they had to change all the documents. There were no documents. And thus, everybody went around in this mood of ambiguity and uncertainty uh, in which they gave the leader the benefit of the doubt. It's happening now without Nixon even having to change those Times files. They're there for anybody to be seen, but nobody even goes and gets them. Okay, sorry. Yes, I have, t I have two questions for you. The first question is, you mentioned the fact that Americans don't seem to be very concerned about the bombing. Uh, how do you account for the fact that the Chinese and uh, the Russians, but especially the Chinese, don't seem to, you know, are buddy-buddy with uh, Nixon and are content to... Uh, issue a weekly statement from Peking uh, denouncing American imperialism. And what do you foresee if Richard Nixon is uh, re-elected as the Chinese response in the next four, perhaps eight years? Are they going to just sit by while we keep doing this, or, or are they playing their own sort of game? It's worse than that, apparently, within sit sitting by. Um, I guess they have graduated into the sphere of the great powers, as we saw by their Pakistan policy, among other things which may be related to the uh, Vietnam-China-U.S. triangle here. I.F. Stone commented, and I think correctly, that the Russians and Chinese bought wheat with the blood of their Indo-Chinese allies. If, you know, people ask, did the Pentagon Papers accomplish anything? Did anything accomplish anything? Did the demonstrations? It's easy to say no when one looks at the polls today. But really, remember a year ago, over a year ago, in July, after a month of the Pentagon Papers discussion, after the Laos debacle, after the NLF seven points, Nixon's polls were respectably low, respectively from the point of view of the American uh, public, I would say then. He was really in bad trouble. It was the China trip that wiped that off the, front, the Pentagon Papers off the front page and the NLF seven points, followed by the actual China visit, and uh, I mean, first the news, then the visit, then the Russian trip, I think to get the American people off the hook a little bit about those polls, that the reason, basic reason for this otherwise astounding and incredible fact that the polls say that the American public see Richard Nixon as a peacemaker, as a man of peace, the man who has dropped more bombs than any human in history, which would seem just totally mad, I think the China and Russia trips go a, a fair most of the way toward explaining that, and in a way that's not in itself discreditable to the American people. They are dramatic, spectacular, impressive. They did look like moves toward peace, but he used them to continue this war, to buy him the freedom to continue this war, and he obviously did that with the collaboration of the Chinese and the Russians. I think that they, they bear a very, a very heavy responsibility for the next four million tons. Uh, the second question may perhaps be sort of difficult for you to answer, and uh, perhaps you will not want to answer it. Uh, being a historian, I'm sure I'm sure you realize you remember the Rosenberg case, and could you please let us in on sort of the decision you had to make as an American Jew to leak the Pentagon Papers? What I mean is, I as an American Jew would have felt a lot better if the papers had been leaked by a good staunch Irish Catholic, you know who. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I remember the Rosenberg case. And of course, the choice was that they should not be leaked, right? Well, I, I understand that. I was. So, I what would you say you about that choice? Was was it possible 
for somebody else to have leaked the papers who was not Jewish, is what I mean. There were many people who had access to the Pentagon Papers. There are hundreds, depending how what you consider, thousands of people who know about the Cambodian invasion, the Laos invasion, who knew about it in advance and we didn't hear about it in advance, who know about it afterwards and we haven't heard about that decision making afterwards. There were people who knew about Haiphong. I know some of them. Some were Jewish, some were not, as you can imagine. There were people uh, uh, who knew um, uh, who know what's going to happen in the next four years. They're not talking. That's very sad to say. I read a piece by Dan Berrigan the other day, a book that I mentioned two books I've just been reading, very impressed by both. One is called uh, Absurd Hopes, what is it, Modest Aims, something like that, Absurd Hopes, Conversations with Lee Lockwood by Dan Berrigan. Another one is his underground writings, which is a marvelous book that I I've, I've just was reading over the weekend. Um, America is hard to find. But in the first of those, he comments on the fact that in prison, he noticed this as much as elsewhere, the terrible failure by his generation, which is 10 years older than mine, but so we're sort of in overlapping generation, the terrible failure of people to act responsibly, to act conscientiously. He says that when he's... Uh, talked of as a hero and so forth. He says, what it comes down to is not that we, my brother and I, did anything that marvelous. We did what we should have done, but that others haven't been doing it on the whole. Now, in this country, there are plenty of people doing what they should be doing. They happen to be mostly your age or a little bit older. The people who went to prison, many of them inspired me, gave me strength to do what I had to do. I think I did no more Jew, Catholic, or Protestant than what I ought to have done. In fact, I have to say to you that uh, that I can't, and I'm not, you know, this is not yeah. a personal thing because I know your attitude is widely held. I've gotten it in lots of letters, among other things. I can't really respect the values as an American or human being or as a Jew of someone who would feel that that kind of criticism permitted him to keep quiet about this war permitted him to do less than he could possibly do to end it. Well, while, well, let me put it this way. You, your wife's, I know her maiden name, I believe, was Marx. Yeah. It, it, it's what you call bad public relations, if you know what listen, I mean. Listen, listen, I want to be serious. I know you're asking me seriously yes, your really first am. question. Let me say very seriously, too. Have you really thought about what you're saying, <laughs> what you're asking? You started out by saying, and I gave you a very serious answer, I don't say it casually, that the Chinese and the Russians sacrificed to their needs, which are whatever they are, considerable, to their needs they sacrificed American, they sacrificed Vietnamese lives, hundreds of thousands of them. They had no right to do that at all. It was a terrible thing for them to do. I, you're really saying to me, as I understand you, that an American Jew can respectably, conscientiously decide to sacrifice Vietnamese to the good public relations of American Jews. No, and that's no, just a no, terrible thing no, to be saying. No, I did not say that. No. What I said was, you and my overriding interest is to end this war, and the impact of releasing the Pentagon Papers would have been much, I think, much greater. It, wasn't, my, it wasn't within my capabilities yeah, to be an Irish yeah. Catholic. Well, I guess that was. I guess that's just the way it had to be. I guess. I'm sorry. I guess that's just the way it had to be. If somebody else had released them, I wouldn't. You have. know, I wish. I wish there were a lot of people who were fighting you for the honor of releasing those things. Yeah. And are you really saying in the end that given that there was no one else, oh, it really I mean, wasn't? Oh, I of course, of course. It's a sad commentary on uh, a lot of other. No, people. are you saying that you wish, as a Jew, that I hadn't done it? No, I had wished. Well, there I aren't had Jews who told me that. See, I had I, wished I, there could have been more than. Well, uh, an Italian to do it with you. I wish. I <laughs> look, we have a terrifically balanced conspiracy. Yeah, it looks like a, a bomber it's crew look, here, you know. We have a Russian, Jewish, uh, so forth. American, we have an Italian Catholic Southerner. The uh, Justice Department is just, it's a very nicely balanced. <laughs> okay. Really. But uh, in fact, to put this in a, a broader context right now, and I, if this. Uh, cuts home to anybody, good, all the better. I think that 
there are a lot of oppressed people in our society who are beginning to liberate themselves by organizing along their own issue, not letting somebody else do it for them, doing it themselves, not by others, whether it's blacks, gays, women, a lot of people, prisoners, soldiers now. Very few of those, except the vets, have really done much about the war, and the war oppresses all of them along with everything else. It's understandable. Uh, it's understandable because uh, they feel they have other issues that uh, are closer to home for them. They've been longer neglected. Why put the burden on them, or the Jews, or whoever, when it isn't them, they who are running the war? And the answer is, they're the ones who are against the war. If they don't end it, if you don't end it, no one else is going to end it. The people who are running it are in favor of it. They support it. They're going to keep doing it. I think the women, the blacks, the others, uh, remember what an enormous step this was for Martin Luther King to, to add the war to his agenda and how much he was criticized among blacks for doing it at the time. And he died soon after. But he recognized something, which is that the war enslaved him and that he didn't have a right even to put the interests of black Americans to buy those at the cost of Indo-Chinese lives. Well, the same applies to everyone else who has the capability of seeing through the oppression that is linked both at home and abroad. And whatever the oppression here is at home, and it's the same people doing it, much the same reasons, but the bombs are falling in Indochina. And that's where the policy, I think, has to be changed first. So I put it to you that uh, I'm meeting lots of people who find reasons to do something else this fall and this month other than to work for Richard Nix uh, for, uh, against Richard Nixon, to work for McGovern, or to, to pay, to register, to do everything else. They find all kinds of reasons. Those reasons uh, don't look good to me, and they are all at the cost of Indochinese lives. One more question. Sorry. I might have two questions. One is about President Nixon and one, the other one about Senator McGovern. Uh, you were criticizing President Nixon's policies very much. And I would like to bring a small example and see what your thoughts are about it. Um, I, will, I will give an example where I'm comparing the war to something else. For example, if someone goes up a ladder, do you think it's more um, wise to jump from the ladder or to go down the same way they got up? Maybe a little bit faster going down. Do you think it wouldn't it be a little bit uh, un, uh, unwise to jump from up to down? You might break your leg or arm or neck. And I think President Nixon was doing the same thing. He inherited a war, and when he got in office, uh, the war was uh, to about its highest levels. And I think he did the just thing by going down slowly. I think it would have been uh, something like a suicide to jump from up to down. What do you think about it, please? Well, far from, uh, say, ridiculing or dismissing such logic, uh, it seemed at least reasonable to me uh, in 1969, let's say, uh, in the kind of abstract terms you've described. You haven't talked about how long he is to be allowed, how slowly he must descend that ladder. Uh, how long, and whether, by the way, uh, how many people, let me be quite blunt about it, he is allowed to kill in the process. By the way, did you foresee that the number of killed and wounded under Nixon would be two million? Excuse me. Um, I would like to say that there are many questions that I might not ask, and this one I'm addressing to the chairman. I think it's much more uh, uh, productive if there were Mr. Daniel and some other person who can speak better than I do, so people can have two views and can see things much clearer. Don't you think so? Well, look, that's what I... Go ahead. They've been invited. They don't want to attend. Oh, I'm sorry. We've, I didn't we've know invited that. conservative Republicans or whatever. They just don't attend. Thank they you. They want to shy away from the campus. Yeah. Yes. Okay, but anyway, on this point, I think I learned, as I say, Frankly, the point of view you described was one certainly that made sense to me in 65, as I say, really as late as 69. But several questions, I think, have to be faced on it. What price do you think is really justifiable? Price, again, I say price, but, you know, what cost to other, to the Indo-Chinese, is acceptable to us? 
to impose. Yes. I think that has to be faced. There are those who will disagree with me on the answer. I would be surprised if many people who voted for Nixon. By the way, I thought in 68 that Nixon was at least as likely to get us out of this war as Humphrey. I voted for Humphrey in the end, and I guess I did it on domestic reasons, uh, which turned out to be pretty important also, more than I expected. But uh, I thought that Nixon would... It, I did not foresee in 68 this 4 million tons of bombs. That's the first question I would ask, how many people find that acceptable, or the next 4 million? Second... A year later, I had finished reading the Pentagon Papers, including some of the passages I've described. I could no longer see this as a war we had begun with good intentions, as the New York Times still says. A war that we had a right to try to win, but that now we must end because we didn't win it, or we can't win it, or we don't want to win it, and we must get out. I ha I'm speaking personally now. I, s I read those papers, and I read that as saying something else. We never had a right to try to win it. We never had a right to win it. Of any way, we never had a right and have never and do not have a right to kill a single Vietnamese. When you talk about suicide, that's surely an exaggeration, uh, and the, other, the earlier speaker raised the same, but talk about costs to this country, loss of influence, loss of power, loss of prestige, loss of self-confidence. All those are possible. None of us, I would say, remotely give us the right to prolong this war, to have prolonged it four more years or four again, to kill two million people, make four million refugees, two million in Cambodia, and I have to go further. Again, speaking personally, and I, and I uh, urge you to, uh, to read the documents and see yeah. if you disagree, we didn't have the right to kill one more Vietnamese. Yeah. Never did. Excuse me, a minute. I'm sorry, that's all we have time yeah, for now. The administration is getting on my back. They're telling me they can hear the sound all the way up there, and i got to cut it off, really. Okay. Sorry. Can I speak low? Can I speak low? You can come, come up to up here, here if you want to speak to them. Thank you for attending.